In 2005, in the Czech Republic, 31-year-old Clara Maurova was just your typical single mother raising her two boys, 6-year-old Andrej and 8-year-old Jacob. It was a healthy home environment. She supported their love of sports, took them to summer camp, and both were excellent students. But these idyllic days would come to an end with just a simple visit from her older sister. Meet Katerina Maurova. Accompanying her this day was a 13-year-old girl named Anna Jarvinen. Katerina had become somewhat of a big sister to the young girl after she was orphaned by her abusive parents. As Clara started to learn more about Anna, she was moved by her story. Besides being physically abused growing up, Anna had numerous health issues, such as kidney failure. She was losing her eyesight as well as her hearing, but all these ailments were a direct result of being diagnosed with leukemia. This kept her in and out of the hospital for the majority of her days, but what Clara found truly inspiring was Anna's positive attitude after such hardship. She was grateful that she was away from her abusers, grateful for her orphanage, and what a godsend Katerina was to be her big sister. Clara's heart went out to the little girl and she let her know that now she had two big sisters, which made Anna smile from ear to ear. So Anna and Katerina would start spending their days at Clara's house. It was one big happy family, along with her sons Andrej and Jacob, and eventually Anna would be spending every day at the house, even without Katerina. And then one day, Clara receives a text from a doctor. He informed Clara that while Anna was in her care, she should follow some procedures that would help Anna feel happy. The instructions were simple, to massage Anna's body for a few hours, mainly concentrating on her groin area. This didn't make Clara very comfortable, but who was she to defy the instructions of a doctor and the needs of a dying child? But as the days go by, similar instructions kept coming. Clara started to have her misgivings and expressed it to the doctor. He understood her concerns and wanted to alleviate them. He sets up a meeting with Clara. The meetup place wasn't at a doctor's office or any medical building in fact. It was at night, in a parking lot, in a car. The man within didn't care to turn on any lights and she never got a good look at him. He presented her with papers that he said were Anna's diplomatic passport and a folder that he said were her medical records. And that was it. Clara felt that he was really professional and her suspicions were gone. And every so often, Katerina would stop by to take Anna to the hospital. Clara, now emotionally attached, wanted to go as well, but Katerina would never allow it. Clara would call the hospital to talk to Anna, but was only answered by the doctor, who said that he would relay anything Clara had to say because he was told specifically by Anna herself that if mommy called, even while she was unconscious, to please whisper what she said in her ears. Clara is so touched that Anna thought of her as a mother. She began to love that child as if it was her own. All her attention began shifting to Anna, wanting to heal her trauma, making sure her last days on earth were comfortable and happy. But she was starting to neglect her boys, who were being sent to their grandparents' house more and more frequently. Soon Clara wanted to adopt Anna altogether, but was met with some bad news from the doctor. Turns out that the doctor was told in confidence by Anna herself that Clara's boys, Andrej and Jacob, were being very cruel to her, and neither the authorities nor himself will ever sign off on the adoption papers if that continued. Clara was so distraught by that news, she didn't even think to question the accusations. She now just had a burning resentment for her boys. But the doctor had a solution. She needed to cure the boys of the evil spirit, and he would tell her exactly how. Soon in the Maurova household, every innocuous thing that the boys did were being punished heavily. If they were moments late for anything, they would be smacked. If something was left out of place, they would be whipped with a belt. If they forgot to close a kitchen cupboard, they would be beaten with a wooden spoon. And on many occasions, she would lock them either in the closet or the bathroom for the entire night. 
But even that wasn't enough for the doctor. He deems Clara's method as ineffective, that the boys needed shock therapy. And here the story becomes completely unhinged. Your discretion is advised. Clara takes Andrej and Jacob down to the cellar, and with the help of Katerina, both are caged like dogs with their hands bound behind their backs. There's no way to imagine how confused and scared the boys were. They had to be thinking, what is going on? Their own mother didn't seem to want them anymore, and even their aunt seemed to hate them, almost out of nowhere. And then footsteps echoed against the cellar walls as someone descended the stairs. Clara and Katerina looked up and acknowledged a visitor. Then another pair of footsteps came down. And then another. It was becoming the worst real-life horror movie as a group of six people filled the room, amongst the strange faces staring at them. Their hearts must have stopped as they recognized two adults from their summer camp. And as cigarette smoke starts to fill the room and the cage door is open, what happens next is what I can only describe as a terrifying glimpse into hell. The boy's bare skin was used to put out the cigarettes while trash bags were tied around their heads. An assortment of tools were used to inflict pain on them and when the bags weren't sufficient enough to muffle their screams they would be drowned in a pot of water. But the main act that would propel this case into the realm of pure depravity is when they started slicing off pieces of the boys and flaying their skin and sharing it amongst each other to consume, even forcing the boys to eat their own flesh as well. Then the boys heard another child scream. A girl. It was Anna. Turns out that she too wasn't exempt from whatever sinister game the doctor had prescribed. When the ritual was done, the kids were left weeping in that dark cellar, given food in bowls to eat off the floor. Cameras were even set up to keep an eye on them, to watch them suffer. And it would continue on like this for another fucking year. Now let's talk a bit about the doctor. He is believed to be the leader of a sinister cult called the Grail Movement. His identity is questionable, but authorities have a main suspect, but we could only get to that later when it would make more sense. As far as the imprisonment of the children, many motives were theorized, but the one that had the most weight is that this particular cult believed that the severe torture of these kids, the consumption of their flesh, brought the members closer to God closer to heaven. Now let's talk about 13-year-old Anna Jarvinen. She was being used by this organization primarily as bait to reel in new members. She suffers from none of the afflictions, especially the cancer. It was all part of the doctor's plan to win Clara's sympathy, bolstered with the help of her own trusted sister Katerina, who was already a full-fledged member of this cult. Now let's move to 2007. A man we'll simply call Mr. Edward was installing a new baby monitor to watch his newborn. After setting everything up, he powers on the monitor and on it, he saw something that had him completely frozen. And then the horror crept in. Instead of seeing a newborn sleeping, he saw a young boy laying on the floor with his hands hogtied behind his back, appearing injured and malnourished eating from a bowl like a dog. Once Mr. Edward was able to snap out of the shock, he grabbed his phone and called the police. Given that these baby monitors wouldn't have much range, the signal had to be coming from his neighbor. Moments later, police kicked in Clara's front door. They found her and Katerina sitting at a table and a quick sweep at the home found all three children and they were rescued. Clara and Katerina were arrested and soon the participating members of the cult were also apprehended. Except 
the doctor. At trial, Clara was all tears and regret that she just wanted to make the final years of a young girl with terminal cancer as enjoyable as possible and that she was brainwashed to believe that her sons were being cruel and needed to be purified. She also revealed that Anna was never hurt during her son's captivity, that they only pretended to hurt her so that the boys wouldn't feel singled out. And trust me, don't even try to rationalize what she just said. But Clara herself was about to be hit with the craziest revelation that her beloved Anna wasn't who she claimed to be at all. She was a 33-year-old woman that had the physical stature of a child. So when the cops raided her house that day, they too were fooled by Anna's appearance until she ran away from the children's home where she and the boys were placed. The media would lend a hand in finding her, tracking her all the way to Norway, and to their surprise, she was pretending to be a 13-year-old boy named Adam. After that, they knew something was terribly wrong. As soon as the Czech authorities were apprised of this fact, she was extradited back to the Czech Republic where her real identity was discovered. Her name was Barbara Skarlova, 33 years old and a diagnosed psychopath. The boys Andrej and Jacob revealed that while their mother was away, Barbara, aka Anna, would come down to the cellar and abuse them as well. Now at this point, it's obvious to say that this was a grotesque family affair. But there was one more family participating in all this. Turns out that a Jan Scarla, Barbara's brother, was down in that cellar hurting the boys as well. And hold on to your chairs as it is believed that a Joseph Scarla, their father, was the doctor the leader of a sect of the grail movement but there wasn't enough evidence to pin him but they did know that he helped barbara escape the czech republic and forge documents that she was a 13 year old boy to enroll her in that norwegian school now i'm gonna start with the bad news Every single person arrested for participating in what is called the worst case of child abuse in the czech republic's history received 10 years or less for their crime. This is a 2007 case being told in 2022. So every person is free today. And if you're thinking to yourself that everyone got off a bit easy, you're fucking right. Now the good news, Andrej and Jacob have found the strength to move forward and are living happy, productive lives. 